Proverbs chapter number 1. We'll begin reading verse number 20. <clears throat> Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the street. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city she uttereth her word, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn ye, or turn you, at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand, and no man regardeth. Because ye have set it not on my counsel, and would none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as a desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. Then shall, or they shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For, they, for that they hated knowledge, and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way, and be filled with their own devices. Now, bear with me a minute, we're going somewhere. But, sounds like doom and gloom. I get that. Proverbs might be one of my, if not my favorite, one of my favorite books of the Bible. But here in chapter number 1, Solomon, using a metaphor of wisdom, being a woman in the streets of a city. Okay, verse number 20 says, She first cries without. That means she's all around the city, hollering out, Who wants wisdom? Who would like to hear wisdom? Then says she cries in the streets, walking up and down the streets, crying, I've got what you need. Who wants wisdom? Then, verse number 21, she cries at the chief place of concourse. She's at the mall, right? She's at the trading post. She's where, in the very center of the city, maybe it was the place where the largest well was, that the women would come and draw out water every morning. Okay, usually around wells, that's where the trading or the markets would open up because it was close to the water. She's walking around that central part of the city where everybody passes through, yelling, who wants to know some wisdom? Then goes on to say, in the openings of the gate, whether you were coming in or you were going out, wisdom was asking you, would you want some wisdom? Would you like understanding? Do you want some knowledge? Then in verse number 22, how long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? In other words, when are you going to put away those childish things? When are you going to grow up and actually seek to know what God would have you to know? Then it says, and the, and the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Okay, scorner is somebody that discredits things. Nowadays we might call them a critic or a pundit. Okay, you know what they enjoy doing? Being critical and making fun of things. You could do the one... Here's the thing. Okay. There's all these riots going on. I mean, Christian said that they had one coming through town, which is why he had to go into work early yesterday. I said, yeah, good luck if they try anything. I know our sheriff. Okay? But all these riots, all these people going nuts on, you know, social media and everything else. Here's the thing. You could take away all the police in the world. They're still going to be complaining about something. Because most of these people aren't really offended at what originally started this all. They just like being scorners. Okay? You could, you know, this is real spiritual, okay? But the old Batman series with the, uh, no, not Adam West, with uh, the Christopher Nolan series, right? Alfred looks at Batman and says, some people just want to watch the world burn. Okay? Doesn't matter what you do. They just want to burn something down. The Joker said he's just a dog chasing a car. He'd never know what to do if he actually caught it. Right? He's just chasing after something. That's what this verse is talking about. Scorners, you can offer them knowledge. You can offer them instruction. You can offer, and I'm not just talking about that crowd. People that always are critical. People always that have that cynical attitude. Doesn't matter what you try to teach them. They're going to reject it because they just want to be critical all the time. Okay? The only thing that makes them happy is trying to take somebody else's thing that they like 
tear it down so that they're miserable too. They take pride, they take joy in being able to take something that somebody else likes or something that somebody loves and then discredit it in their own mind. Right? Confrontational. Why do you think last week we talked about the Apostle Paul? He said, when we came in unto you, we didn't use enticing words, but we did have a compassion for you as a nurse for the child that she takes care of. Right? We had compassion, but we spoke things that we knew were going to rub you the wrong way. These people have no compassion. Right? They speak, they're like the shock jocks. They'll say anything to get a reaction. Okay? Scorners just want to scorn. Okay, then, verse number 23, Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Think about true wisdom. You can't really soak it all up on the first go round. It says, Turn at my reproof. Listen to my correction. And to turn, what, what's the word that we use all the time? Repent. It means to turn from the way you were going. Come back. It says, I will pour out my wisdom unto you. And then it says, I will pour out my spirit unto you. And make known my words unto you. It's one thing to read them. It's another thing to have the person that spoke it explain it to you. Make it to where not only you understand it, but you understand it as if God wrote it just to you. It says, I will pour out my spirit. It's one thing to get wisdom. It's another thing to get the spirit of the person that wrote it. Okay? That's, I mean, Solomon, who wrote this, didn't have the indwelling Holy Spirit as we know it today. He didn't have the completed Word of God, but yet he knew that if you desired to know what God said and to understand why God would have you to do it, God will pour His Spirit out to where you can understand it. You'll get the true meaning behind the wisdom. It's not just words on a page. It is the very Word of God. And Solomon's saying, if you desire wisdom, God will give you, not just press down, shake and bubbling over, He'll give it to you to where you understand it as God intended you to understand it. Okay? Read a lot of stuff in English classes over the years. I really don't care. I don't care about understanding it the way that the author intended it. Okay? I really didn't even care to read it. Especially when we got into Shakespeare too long. Always had five acts. And at most of the time, he was, he was making up words. They didn't even exist until he used them. Okay? Then you're like, well, what in the world does that mean? You didn't care. You got lost. Right? I get it. But if you desire to know what the Lord says, you may not get the words on the page, but God will pour out His Spirit unto you, and you'll understand it. Right? It's one of the beauties of being indwelled by the one that wrote it. Okay, but then, verse number 24, Because I have called, and you refuse. I've stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have said it not all my counsel, and with none of my reproof. In other words, wisdom was very benevolent. Wisdom was always there offering, but nobody received. Because we set our counsel at naught, it says. What's that mean? We took it and said, well, thanks for this, and then we put it over in the trash pile. We said that doesn't mean anything to us. We have no use for this. Okay? It's like a fruitcake at Christmas. What do you do with that? Right? What's tradition? Well, tradition states that I don't eat things that taste like that. <laughs> okay? If it's held together by super glue, I ain't eating it. Right? Oh, that's the same fruitcake that you've been giving people for 12. You just keep passing it around every year. Right? It's the traveling fruitcake. Right? There are two things that could survive a nuke. Cockroaches and fruitcake. I don't want it. Right? But when you get something and you have no need for it, you see no value in it, what do you do? You pitch it. That's what wisdom's saying. My counsel, you regard it as dung. Yeah, you threw it out the window of the house and said, well, don't have any need for that. But then, verse number 20, or 26, I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. Okay, God wrote it this way in another passage. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. 
you'd have to be brain damaged to believe that with as good as God has been to us, as good as God's been to this church, as good as God's been to America over the past 220, 40, somewhere in there. I can't remember. I'm not doing math right now, okay? But it's been a while, almost 250 years. As good as God's been to our country, we're without excuse not to thank God every morning when we wake up for what He gave us. But you'd also have to be brain dead to realize that America went away from God a whole long time ago. And what we have now, the calamity, the destruction, is the result of America not wanting to know what God says. Taking God's opinion and setting it at naught. Taking God's reproof or correction and scoffing at it. Saying, we don't need that. Well, when it says that wisdom will laugh at our calamity... You ever be in the midst of something maybe tragic, something maybe it's a little depressing, and then you got somebody like me that's got a sick and dark sense of humor and just trying to lighten the situation up will make a joke in a bad time? You can still find something to laugh at? That, that's not what this is talking about. Right? What's that? That's called just, hey, I'm tired of being depressed. Let's look at this from a different angle. Right? That's ironic humor. What's this? This is, I told you, and you did it. Any, I'm with, I did everything I could, and really, you're a bunch of fools. What do you do? You laugh at fools, the court jesters. Right? It was their job that no matter what, they had to be funny. But see this, when it's our fault, here, let me do this. Miss Lisa? If Brother Mike left a rake out in the front yard or a shovel or something and then he was going around and doing yard work and you said, hey, you left that shovel out there in the yard. Okay. And he just kept doing the work. Or he just walked past the rake. Hey, don't forget to pick that up. And then he stepped on it and smacked him in the face. You'd laugh at him because you told him. And you told him again. And you said, hey, I know you've been doing a lot. But you still left that thing out in the yard. I don't want you to step on it. Then he steps on it. It's funny. You can't feel sorry for him. It's his own fault. God doesn't feel sorry for us when destruction or desolation comes. And he's tried to warn us. Then we turn around and say, well, this is all God's fault. God laughs at that. And he says, really? It's my fault? Day in, day out, I'm trying to draw you to the seat of wisdom where you can understand what's going on, but instead you reject it and you go your own way. He laughs at our... He doesn't care. There's no sympathy there. He says, this is what you have reaped. You brought this on yourself. Now, in loving kindness, if we repent and turn from it, He'll welcome us back in the fold, but we'll still have to deal with that desolation and destruction in our life. Repenting doesn't take away the consequences from what we did before. Right, But then, when your fear cometh as desolation and destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. Now that word desolation means a storm. Fear doesn't always happen all of a sudden. You see those clouds coming in the distance. Right? Most animals know when a storm's coming. Right? They say that in the midst of tornadoes and everything else, if there's livestock out in the field, they'll all lay down in the field. They know something's coming, and they know the best place to be is close to the ground. Right? But you can see the clouds coming. You can hear the thunder coming in the distance. And slowly that fear builds up in you. If we reject wisdom, and the reason that this storm's coming is because of my idiocy, my lack of desire to hear what God has to say on the situation... All that's going to happen is that storm's going to get closer and instead of peace, instead of knowing the peace speaker, as mom sings that song in the choir, who said, peace be still and the winds and waves stop. The storm stopped instantly. He's not in the midst of that storm with me. And instead of having peace, that fear will just rise up in you until it hits a fever pitch and there's a tornado coming your way. Right? But then it also says, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. What's that? Here one second, gone the next. If you were taking two photos, everything's okay, and then after the whirlwind comes through, everything's gone. 
Right? Well, here's the thing about a whirlwind. Which way is it going to turn? Nobody knows. God has his way in the whirlwind. That means God knows what it's going to do, but we can't. Right? Try and figure out which way the wind's going to blow next. Right? Weathermen, they try and predict it all the time. Most of the time, they get it wrong. Right? Best way to figure it out, stick your finger out the window. Well, it's blowing that way right now. That's good enough for me. That's what the Bible says. All you know is when it's blowing and where it's blowing right now. You don't know when it's going to blow next. Don't know when it's going to stop. Don't know which direction it's going to go. You don't know if it's going to change directions while you're staying in there right now. But I do know the wind's blowing. That. That's the metaphor for the presence of God. If we don't pay attention when the wind's blowing, a whirlwind may come and take everything from us. It's a whole lot better to be steered by a calm wind in a sailboat than it is to be driven by a storm. Okay, but then they shall call unto me but I will not answer they shall seek me early and they shall not find me why did all this happen for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord yeah, I, mean, I used to remember I can't remember how many times it's written in the Bible but the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom you really want to know some true things have it explained to you by the spirit of God to where it's not just knowledge anymore now it's wisdom it's tempered with experience your experience no but I didn't want to go through the experience to get the wisdom so I sought God and he explained it to me but still you got to labor with it a little bit before it can be turned into wisdom just because you know John 3.16 doesn't mean that you know how to go out and present the clear-cut example of the gospel to somebody. Right? It takes a little bit of wisdom. That's why we're not supposed to wield this foolishly. Right? Because somebody not knowing how to use it can cause a whole lot more harm than they can good. You want to know the best way to witness something? Tell them what Jesus did for you. You know that. Right? What's that? That's wisdom. I, I don't know what he'll do for you, but I know what he did for me. Right, you may need something. I mean, we all need our sins forgiven, but you may be in a completely different situation. But I do know what He did for me. I do know what He did for some of these people throughout the Word of God. And because I read that and I believed that He'd do that for me, I just believed that He would, and He did. There's wisdom in that. But somebody getting up and spouting off a whole bunch of verses, not knowing really what the verses mean trying to get you just to raise your hand to admit something so that they could say well somebody admitted that they were lost and I told them to say a prayer and they got saved no wisdom in that in fact the Bible says you made that person twofold and child of hell right? true wisdom is not just knowing it understanding it it is comprehension and one of the biggest I've said this for years but one of the biggest struggles of teaching a class is that in order to teach you must first learn you can't teach what you have not understood and here's the thing some of y'all older than me some of y'all been saved longer than I've been alive right how in the world am I supposed to teach you something right how in the world am I supposed to offer something to somebody else that you know according to the word of God they're long off the milk of God they're on the stake of God Right? How am I supposed to teach them something? Right? I'm somewhere in between fillets and you know two percent milk. Right? Whatever that is, I'm at you know Longhorn. I haven't made it to the real stuff yet. Right? I'm getting there by the grace of God. But what it you must first understand. Right? All these people that teach Sunday school, they study throughout the week. Well, you say, well, they're teaching on Daniel and the lions then. Yeah, but I forget things every now and then. Maybe God wants to bring out something in that story that I knew, but I forgot it. But they have to understand it and comprehend it before they can give it to those children. Right? Same thing here. Why do you think that the Bible says that a pastor is supposed to be given to study in prayer? Because he's supposed to comprehend the will of God for the people of God so that he can deliver that message from God to the people of God as God intended it. It's a heavy burden. That takes a lot of effort 
Not because there's a lack of wisdom, but because I got to get the flesh out of the way so my spirit can understand the truths of God as God wants me to understand them. Wisdom saying it takes a lot of work to get wisdom. You got to labor in order to have wisdom. You know what it takes to have folly or to scorn? Very little effort. That's why verse number 30 says, Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. You didn't want to labor out of a love for the things of God to understand what God had to say. So now you get to eat of that sour fruit, that rotten fruit that you grew. God now scoffs at all of your efforts and you're going to go to the field and find nothing there that will help you. But why did it all happen? Because of a lack of the fear of the Lord. Because, verse number 29 says, they have hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. And let's be honest. I stopped watching the news for a little bit. I found a guy that I like because he takes all the news and he just boils it down to what I need to know. And then in about 45 minutes, he gives me all the highlights. I'm okay with that. Okay? But there's talk. These people are nuts. Some people are saying, well, if Trump wins again, Democratic states are going to secede from the Union. No, they won't. You think all them blue states are really going to win against all them red states? Let's say, who's been taking away guns for all them years? Blue states. We win. But they said, well, no, no, the army's going to help us. No, the army said, we don't want nothing to do with this. But they say, well, if Trump gets elected, there's going to be riots in every major city around the, the U.S. Whatever these people, you guys remember the L.A. riots back in the 90s? You guys remember? Great story that came out of the L.A. riots, roof Koreans. There were a bunch of people. They were immigrants from Korea. They naturalized. They were American citizens. They said, we don't care what's going on. Y'all ain't going to burn down my store. You're not going to say, they sat up on the roof with rifles and shotguns. Everybody said, they're nuts. Guess whose store didn't get messed with? The roof Koreans. They said, we've paid too much. We put too much invest. You know what? They saw the knowledge. They saw the wisdom in what is what we call the American dream. No, no, no. I had nothing, and I came here because this was opportunity. And I got a little storefront that had a bedroom and a home right above it, an apartment. And the whole family lives here, but we've got a place that this is our own. And you ain't going to take it. And guess what? Nobody took it. Right? That's what America was founded. No, no, no. If you want to take from it, we want a representation. And if you don't want to give it, we'll do it our own. Right? You know what? God's a, God is an equal opportunity provider. He says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which give to all men liberally. But you know why people don't want wisdom of God? You know why they scoff at those people that are Bible thumper, gun toting, deplorables? Because they don't care what God has to say. So what, I mean, who knows what... I know by the end of the book, America got to fall off the map. Right? Well, what's one of the ways that that could happen? Well, for years I've said, who in the world is going to come in and take over with the military we got? Who's going to come in and try and bribe us with the economy that we've got? Well, that's gone down a little bit. Okay, we're only in $500 trillion in debt now. I don't even know the number anymore. Used to, I did. But, but how in the world is this going to happen? Civil War might do it. But they often say, it's not the enemy outside that will get you, it's the enemy on the inside. I don't know. I don't know. That's why God gave it to us in prophecy. We don't need to know. But all I know is, it's got to come down to the line. But here's the point. If you care about them people that you've been praying for for years, that they get saved or they get back in church, if you care about them youngins that are coming around here, the only hope that they have is that some of us get the fear of the Lord in our hearts. You want to know what we'll do, what we cannot? God. I can't walk down to Washington, D.C. and sort all this out. Wish I could. Wish I could go wide earth and say, hey, 
tell them I'm coming and hell's coming with me. But I can't do that. I wish that, you know, there's an old saying in the Texas Rangers, you, one riot, you get one Texas Ranger, and that's all you needed. Because originally there was only one guy that could go, he sorted out a riot, and they said, hey, it only takes one Ranger to sort out whatever problem you got. I wish that that were true. What, 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 what am I going to do? What are you going to do? Sort everything out. Doesn't matter. Right? There are those that have positions of authority. There are those that are higher than them. And then there's one that's over all of them. His throne's on the side of the north. Right? Not one man comes to power that God doesn't ordain it or allow it, one or the other. Either because we're getting what we reaped or we're reaping what we sowed or because we prayed that God give us one that he had anointed and then God puts that one in office. But either way, God's still got it all in control. I can't. He can. You know what moves the Lord in compassion to care about what we care about? When we have a full reverence for Him. A true fear of the Lord. You know why wisdom will come to those that fear the Lord? Because they care about what God thinks. You know why America's in the shape that we're in? Because for a long time, America stopped caring what God thinks. Has no desire to know what God thinks. I mean, I may not agree with everything the guy said. Actually, in fact, I don't agree with him. a lot of things that he said that was publicized on television. But, I mean, even Ronald Reagan knew that there was something special enough about God to have Billy Graham at his inaugurations. Right? But the whole situation America's in, because long ago on the coasts, people stopped caring what God said and said, well, tell me what man thinks. People stopped caring about what their neighbor thought of them and they said hey just let me do what I want to do and I'm not going to hurt you you don't hurt me and then just let me do whatever I want well now it's hurting some people it's not just protesting people are dying in these cities I can't straighten that out what if that came to Florence well I know what I'd be prepared to do how about you Right? what if that swept through Cincinnati what if that found you at your workplace I, I don't want that I want God's blessings right I want God to be able to get a hold of this nation's heart and bring true revival but we're just going to teach on this more I can't sort it out but God can you know how God can sort it out first it starts here with me not with somebody else in the church. Not with those group of teens that keep meeting down at the rock altar to pray before church. Not with those men that come Saturday night and pray for the services the next day. Right? Not with the pastor. Me. Takes accountability if you want God to sort things out. David's great sin with Bathsheba. Right? And Uriah the Hittite. You know when the Lord forgave him of it? When he, the man of God came and said, Thou art the man. And David said, It's my fault accountability right Note, before that David desired the presence of God on his life so much I mean when he brought the ark back into the city he had been given all those sacrifices every so often all the way back to Jerusalem right he's just worshiping God all day by the time he got there he's slap happy in the Lord he's dancing all around everybody else well one of his wives said hey uh, you're acting a little foolish he said hey I was full of God and I don't care what you think Right? There was a time in David's life that he said, I just care about what God thinks. Don't care about anything else. Right? Then, after he gets right, he did twice as much for God afterwards than he did before his great sin. Because then he understood forgiveness and compassion and mercy. And he had double the reason to worship God. But David desired to know what God wanted him to do. And you know when it really picks up? Well, America, right, the world, everything on that map, you know where that starts with? Me. Because Jesus didn't say, well, when the church goes, no, no, no. He said, go unto all the world. Talking to me. Talking to you. When first we take accountability that it all starts right here. I can't go unless I'm where God wants me to be. I can't take 
the gospel. I can't take the truth. I can't take wisdom to somebody else if I'm not spiritually where I need to be. Because then the word will never return void, but it's a whole lot better when the word's taken by someone that they pray over that seed before they put it in the ground. They fill up that water tank in the morning and say, Lord, I'm going to go out and water because you told me to water. God's going to give the increase. But when the water falls where God wants it to fall, and God doesn't have to wait for it to run down the hill to where He wanted it to be, when we pour out water exactly where God wants it, not permissibly where God wants it, no, 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 perfect will of God. How do we get there? Fear of the Lord is going to cause me to seek out His wisdom. But see, if enough people start caring about what God wants, then collectively, the church will have a fear of the Lord. Right? I've longed to, maybe this is selfish, Brother Clint, let's be honest. I don't know if this is what, I've long wanted the presence of God around here so much that the crowd that just blows in for Sunday morning service, they come in and they feel guilty before any singing, for any worshiping, for any preaching. The presence of God's just so strong that they say, why have I not been here more than that? You know where that starts? A whole lot of people getting a fear or reverence of the Lord and desire the wisdom so that, Lord, when I come in, I don't want anything between me and thee. Lord, I don't want it to be I'm following the footprints of Jesus. I want to be hand in hand we walk each day, hand in hand along the way. I don't want to be following a road map. I want to see you. Right? When that's birthed into our heart, then if other people around us if we collectively do that, God's going to start shining out a little bit. Not because we deserve it, not because we did something special, but just because He rewards those that are obedient. You want blessings? Be obedient. What did wisdom say? She said, because you didn't want my reproof, because you didn't want my stretched out hand, then fear is going to come upon you as desolation and destruction as a whirlwind. You know what the opposite of desolation is? Abundance. You know what the opposite of destruction is? Being established. In other words, if you were to listen to wisdom, established means I'm on the rock and I can't be moved. Nothing's going to shake my foundation. You know what abundance is? Well, I don't know how it happened, but every time I reach down, to, like Brother Mike preached on Wednesday night, every time I reach down into that barrel of meal and I pour out some oil from that cruise, I swear I used every last drop and every crumb that I had left, but the next time I reached in, there was just more. Well, you didn't labor for that, no, but I got a God that loves me a whole lot. And I've learned that when I care about what He cares about, everything in my life is taken care of, not so that I can brag about it, but so that I can start caring about the lives of others. When you get more concerned about what's going on spiritually in somebody else's life, not so that you can be a Pharisee and judge them, but because of true compassion, true love. When you say, Lord, give me a burden for that person so that I can pray for them, so that I can witness to them, so that I can go out and shine as light. Maybe I could be a little salt so that they can last long enough to hear the truth. Right? Lord, protect our nation so that there's still a place in the world where, like fellowship track that we heard about not too long ago, Billions of tracks being sent out around. Show me another country where you could have that freedom. Even in Great Britain, they don't have free speech like we have it. They don't have the right to the printed word and freedom of the press. You know what happens over there if you call a dude that's dressed as a chick a him? You can get fined. You know what happens in Canada? They jail you. Think I'm kidding? It's coming down the pike. All because... It thinks that it's a she, but really it's a him. And I'm the one that's confused. I go to jail. Used to, they consider that a mental illness. You know what God considers it? Sin. And don't get me wrong, if there's somebody that really, they messed up in the head and that's why they don't know, let's get them some help. If not, let's get them unconfused. Because if they're confused on that, it's going to take a whole lot more for them to get unconfused on things like salvation. They don't know what's up and down or which bathroom to use. Right? What's my point? 
a long time ago people stopped caring about what God thought and that's the reason we're but America's still the place that because God honors those that came before us because I, God honors those that came and said I want a place where I can worship God in spirit and in truth is the word intended because I, I doesn't matter if I got to meet in my basement doesn't matter if everybody else in town thinks that I'm funny I have a copy of the word of God and I can take it share it with my family share it with my neighbors maybe one day Lord will bless us with the church and because those just wanted to worship God and they cared about what God said whereas the community they would say you want to have laws started people came out as a community and said hey this is what God said we shouldn't do so let's not do it and then they said well some people aren't doing what God wanted them to do so we got to make some consequences for this right? that's not st- well what happens when he gets here you go to jail right what happens if you burn down a building you going to jail unless you live in one of them blue states on the coast they let them jokers free Well, it's the whole, people don't care what God says. You want to know why we have what we have? Because people did care what God said. But if enough people collectively come together, God will bless collectively. If revival starts in your heart, and then revival breaks out in a community, ain't no telling what God's going to do. People are still hurting. News isn't bringing up the fact that some people haven't worked in a while. News ain't bringing up how, you know, people had to go back to school shopping, but everybody's out of everything that they needed to go get. Right? After a day or two, they went to Kroger and there wasn't nothing left. Right? Now people have to stay at home with their kids because they can't go to work because the school's saying, no, you got to take them three days a week. We're only going to deal with them two days a week. Well, then why am I paying you? My tax, I want three-fifths of my tax dollars back. No, they don't like that. What? What's going on? People in a mess. Even if they're making ends meet, even if God's blessed them, it's still stressful. Their basket's still turned upside down. But when people care about, Lord, I don't know why we're in this mess, but I know you can sort it out. Just tell me what I need to do day in, day out. If we all focus on me, it doesn't matter what my neighbor's doing. I'm focused about me. I'm trying to get myself in line with God. I'm just trying to tell some people along the way that God's been good to me and He'll be good to them too. I'm just trying to show them that hey, I don't do that because God said not to and I love God. I do do that because God said to and I love God. But if enough people live that way, then it won't just be a personal thing, it won't be a church thing, it won't be a community thing. It'll be a country thing. I've read about the great Scottish revival. No, no, in fact, the United Kingdom is actually more than one country. That's why it's a united kingdom. And you got England, Scotland, Wales, and then Northern Ireland. But with Scotland, that whole country, God did something in it. Scotland was sending out missionaries to all over the world. Great, powerful preachers were preaching, you know, you must be born again, and they's getting saved by the droves. And then once they got saved, they had such a love for God, they said, Lord, send me somewhere to tell somebody else about Jesus. And you know what? Today, we're sending missionaries back to Scotland because you can't find a Baptist church over there. Some of them don't go by Baptist. Some Anabaptist, which is what we came from originally. right? But you can't find a Bible-believing church hardly in Scotland. You know why? Because a long time ago, people stopped caring what God thought. And as a result, a place that used to be on fire for God it isn't but I do find that if God could send revival to that country he surely can send it here and I ain't just talking about Kentucky no 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 Ohio, Indiana, the whole SEC, the ACC, the Big East, the Big Ten, Big Twelve all of it but you know what it takes personally people caring about what God says and not just a passing care like, you know, you shake hands with somebody or you see somebody out and about, oh, hey, how's your day doing? You really don't care. You're just trying to be polite. A lot of us are trying to be polite with God. Okay, Lord, Sunday, what would you have me do? Okay, Lord, it's Wednesday. I've had a pretty rough week. Can I get some help here? I care about what you say. But what about uh, 
Monday morning before you brush your teeth, or maybe you brush your teeth, because I understand if you don't brush your teeth, you feel nasty all day, right? So maybe you brush your teeth, then you do your daily devotion, okay? Some of us got to have about four cups of coffee before we can do our daily devotion because we still sleep. Right, but Monday morning, Lord, it's another week. By the grace of God, you'll bring me through it like you did the last one. But Lord, first, what do I need sustenance-wise spiritually for today? But then also, Lord, I care about how you want me to live today. Who you want me to tell today. Give me a burden for somebody. How many of y'all take tracks and pray over them before you give them out? Saying, Lord, show me the one that needs this track. How many of y'all have tracks available to give out when you're not at church? Not being indicted, I'm just saying if you care about what God cares about, He cares about taking the gospel. He cares about telling. He cares about going. So I know that if you care about what God cares about, you care about that. Right? How many of us care about separation? Spiritual separation. We're in the world, but not of the world. Living apart. A sanctified people. A group that are proud to not only be called Christians, but they live up to the responsibility of the name Christian. Christ-like. Do we care about that? What about standards? No, I don't do that because I don't... Some standards are personal convictions. Right? I get that. But I don't do that because I believe God wouldn't want me to do that. Because I don't think that I'd be able to witness somebody if they saw me doing that. Right? Because if I had to explain that to somebody that was lost, that could be a hindrance to the guy. It'd be a stumbling block, not a stepping stone. I want my life to bring people closer to God, not to trip over and die and go to hell. You know when people start thinking in those terms? When they care about what God cares about. But most of the time, I care about the things in my life too much to even think about what God wants out of my life. I care about what's going on with me and my struggles and my problems. Did he not say, cast all your cares upon him? That's not because we can't carry them. You can carry them if you want to. God will let you. You'll be miserable. God said, cast your cares upon me because one, he does care for you. But because he cares for us so much, he says, I understand, I bought you with the price. Which means I knew you'd have all them problems when I bought you. I bought your problems too. But what he's saying is, I'll take the problems that I bought from you so that you can embrace what I envisioned for you. To be a servant. To take the most precious message that's ever been delivered. So precious that it had to come from heaven and deliver it to the hearts of those that need it. To live as a representative, and last week as we talked about, an ambassador unto God. And to embrace it and be able to say, I care more about looking like Christ than I care about the problems in my life. His grace is sufficient for me. His strength is made perfect in my weakness. I rolled all my problems over onto Him so that when I got up from the altar begging the Lord to take these burdens from me, I could go out and do what God burdened me to do. That's why we're supposed to cast our cares on Him, to unhinder ourselves from the constraints or the desires of this flesh. Of course there's people that I'd like to be saved, but if I'm only thinking about them all day long, I'm neglecting my duty to go out and take the gospel to those that God intends me to take it to. Lord, I commit this into your hands because I know that you can do better with it than I can. And Lord, make me into a vessel of honor so that I can go and people will say, I want to know what that guy knows. Well, lucky for you, if any man lack wisdom, you can ask a God. God gives everybody liberally. Here's a little bit of wisdom that he showed me. Here's what he did in my life. No, I've still got problems, but God's got my problems. I'm more focused on what God wants me to do today. Revival can't happen. But I mean, if. I know God wants to send it. I don't like to think about it this way. But if revival didn't come, what are you still doing? What if God gave enough that we ought to have revival already? Which He has. But what if the next meeting never happens? What if God causes something to happen? Jeffrey don't end up coming. 
that, or hard rock, as we used to call them. Yeah. What if Brother Luther never gets to walk through them doors again? If I care about what God cares about, well, if God intended them to be somewhere else, that's between God and them. If God desired for them to be somewhere else, I don't want them here because that means that God's not going to bless. I care about what God wants, when God wants it, how God wants it. You get to that point, things will start picking up. But it won't just pick up in your life. If you stay that way, it'll pick up around the church. It'll pick up around the community. Try and keep God contained. Everybody throughout history has tried to do it. Herod tried to kill all the youngins, two and younger, trying to keep God contained. The Pharisees said, don't go out and preach in his name. They didn't need to, because everybody that saw that lame man get healed did a whole lot of preaching to people about Jesus that day. All right, they told Paul, don't do it again. He just kept going city to city, doing it again. Why? Because he cared about what God thought. He cared about what God intended for people to hear, not himself. If we want things to change, I can't do it, but God can. You know how God can do it? When we get out of the way. Individually, collectively, as a country. If we just got out of the way and said, Lord, you tell us what to do, things would be a whole lot better. But it's real hard to admit, Lord, I was wrong. It's real hard to humble yourself, and trust me, you don't want God to humble you. You don't want God to knock you off the pedestal. It's better to get off your own pedestal. And say, Lord, I don't care about that no more. I care about what you want me to know. I care about what you want me to do. So teach it to me so that I can understand it. And once I understand it, then I can give it to others. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.